Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whenever and wherever you're watching us. Welcome to another episode of Conical Supremacy. My name's John Noreko, and I've got my extreme co-host over here and the guy who thought this thing up, Mr. Doug Tornquist. Hey, Doug, how's it going good today, Good, John. Man? Nice to see you. Back at you, man. Hey, I just wanted to let everybody know we're sorry that we haven't had some new content, but today is going to be a show that is over the top. So, Doug, what's what have you been up to since we haven't had a show in a bit? Mm, you know, um playing been doing uh, some sessions you know some concerts um even some students showed up you know so there are rumblings of uh you know it feels like uh back to normal doesn't it it's busy right how about you yeah uh back at you man i mean um i'm looking forward to my days off i've been working a lot uh picking up things here and there uh disneyland is full bore right now and we've had a lot of covid insurgency both with some of the guys and with subs so it's been, uh, for those of you who don't know, we got a really spike going on right now here in Southern California. And uh, so we're trying to watch out and stay healthy and stuff like that. You just got back from a session with Mankin, right? Something you can talk about or no? Uh, I think so. Yeah. We're doing uh, uh, something called uh, Disenchanted. It's a sequel to, um, was it called Enchanted? Anyway. Um, but it's, it's great to see Alan Menken. I mean, you, you think of all the music that he wrote, you know, he was just it in the eighties and the nineties. Um, definitely the sound of Disney when it comes to films, well, right? Sure. Well, sure. You think of uh, what little mermaid and, um, Aladdin and, you know, all those just incredible. One day we were doing a session of his stuff and they brought in a bunch of kids and there was a piano in the back corner. He just sat down at the piano and played, just played and sang his stuff. And it was it was jaw dropping to hear Alan Menken play tune after tune after tune after tune, and you realize what a huge, it's a beautiful, what a huge play. influence he's been, you know. So, so that's well, what we've been up to, yeah. You know, school's right around the corner for both of us, so um, I'm really looking forward to that actually. And yeah, okay. I am. <laughs> and uh, you want to just go ahead and, and and you know bring our guest in, man? What do you think? Well. I mean, this is uh, talk about a legend and someone who's done someone who's done things with our instrument that um, you know I don't know if anyone will ever surpass. I mean, just the sheer level of talent and showmanship in all genres, um, classical, popular. Uh, it's I, I think we're just so lucky today. Let's go ahead and, and bring him in. The one and only. My dear friend and colleague, Mr. Stan Freeze. Aha. Hey, Stan, how's it going, man? Great. How are you guys? This is great. <laughs> good. We're doing great. We can't thank you enough thank for you. being this here today, fun, man. This is fun, man. This is fun. Can we start at the beginning, Stan? I mean, your history, your performances, everything that you've done throughout your life, man, is just so cool. And for those of you out there who, have, who don't know Stan, um, I've been fortunate to know him for coming up on 40 years now. And... Uh, in fact, he's the guy that, that hired not only me, but also Doug back in the day when we first both started at Disneyland. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're the cat, man. I can't begin to say it. But, you know, I'd like to start kind of like how, how you got started on the tuba. And, you know, you were nice enough to send me a, a bio thing. And we were just talking off camera. Your dad was the one, was a trumpet player, but he was kind of the one that kind of got you going playing tunes and doing that whole thing. Exactly. Right, man. Yep. Uh, actually how the whole thing started was that in fourth grade back there in Edina, Minnesota, they had an assembly and uh, at our school and the, one of the band directors came out and had a whole table full of all the instruments uh, for all the kids uh, there to see. And you could pick whatever one you wanted to play. And so I picked the tuba. And because uh, I had remembered that when my dad was a band director at a high school, the, the high school tuba players used to pick me up, stick me in the bell and then walk around with me as just a little kid. And I remembered that. So uh, so anyhow, so I said, yeah, I'd like to play the tuba. They said, OK, great. So we go home that night and I tell my folks that I picked the tuba and my dad was so cool. He didn't freak out because he knew I would quit right away the tuba. <laughs> And so, <laughs> so he was just real cool about it. Well, it, I surprised everybody, and it just became fun. And what he did was that he would take 
uh, cornet solos, or no, excuse me, a cornet part and a tuba part to a march. He'd get these march books. Then he and I, he would play the cornet part. I'd play the tuba part uh, out of these books, you know, these little march books. And we did that every night, and it became really fun. So I really had a good time uh, with the tuba. Then he brought home some solos and didn't tell me they were trumpet solos and didn't tell me that I shouldn't be able to do it. So once again, uh, I won my first uh, high school state contest when I was in fifth grade. Uh, on a thing called Solo Pomposo. And it's just kind of like I seem to fit right with the tuba and the, the whole thing worked and the rest is history. So Stan, obviously you were a, you were a star if you're playing Solo Pomposo in the fifth grade. Um, what, I mean, you know, sometimes tuba players are just clearly, you know, far heads above their competition. Was that, was that your story? I mean, were you like this high school phenomenon? in Minnesota when, when you were, I guess, yeah, I guess you'd see that, you know, it was just, it's easy to do that with a tuba, you know, you got, <laughs> you just got to be kind of good and there you're there. No, it was great. I mean, my, I, I owe all of that uh, to my dad naturally, like we talked about before. And then it was just fun to play the tuba. And I started my own band, Stan Freeze and the Five Icicles, hot band with a cool name. And uh, so we had, we, had a, we had a Dixieland band, you know, in sixth grade or whatever. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And then, uh, yeah, I started doing a single act. Here's the crazy thing. Uh, a friend of my parents was a, was a talent agent. And so he knew that I played the tuba and he thought that was funny. And so he said, how about if we build an act around you? Because he knew that I was good on the tuba. And I said, sure. My dad said, sure, let's do it. So the next thing you know, uh, I'm doing this act and I'm playing at the state fair. Uh, and I'm in fourth grade, seventh grade, something like that. Oh and the Welk Band was playing at the same thing. So we were at a lunch together and I played the tuba solo for Lawrence Welk and his orchestra while they ate lunch, which I'm sure they hated. But anyhow, afterwards... Uh, they came up to me and said, hey, would you uh, want to be on the show? And uh, they said, we'll move you out to California. Well, my mom and dad both had jobs. I uh, couldn't do that, and I, I really didn't want to leave anyhow. So um, I just said, well, you know, let me do a couple of guest shots and uh, take it from there. Hey, hey, man, you know, speaking of this act thing that you used to do, you were telling me off camera, and, and I'd love to hear the story because – we got a picture that we're going to put up with you uh, sitting in front you know, with your horn on sitting in front of Richard Nixon, who was the president at the time. But you were telling me that you went on this Russian tour with your act. Right, man. Is well, that, actually, is that actually, what I got? No, that? Actually, what had happened was uh, I was chosen. The uh, the Russian minister of culture came over to the United States to reopen the cultural exchange program between the Soviet Union and America. And so at one of the things that they were observing, uh, the Soviets, was the University of Minnesota Wind Ensemble. And they asked, the Wind Ensemble asked me to come over if I would play Carnival of Venice while the Russians were in the audience. So I said, yeah, sure. So anyhow, uh, I did the Carnival of Venice uh, with the Soviets in, in, the, uh, in the audience. And uh, so that was that. And the next thing you know, I get a call. And they say, uh, you, you're going to be going, we'd like you to go to uh, Russia, Soviet Union. And so I said, I don't want to go because I'm teaching school. I'm having a great time teaching school. I, I just soon not go. And then 24 hours later, my school got a call uh, from D.C. saying that I would be going. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> right now, so I, I'm so thankful it did because that's what put me on the map was that dumb Carnival of Venice for this, you know, Soviets. So you and just you were, never know, man. And you were in Russia for two months. Yes, in the Soviet Union for yeah, two but, months at that time. Yeah, but Stan, you told me that because you did the whole Soviet Union thing, the White House called you and said, you're right. going to reprise that and do it for Nixon, exactly. right? Yeah, they had seen, somebody uh, had been following that tour. So they just said, uh, on your on your way back, we want you to stop and, uh, and come to and do this uh, at the Rose Garden. And so there was for Kissinger, Dobrynin, Nixon, and uh, and some other people from the White House. So yeah, I did it, and it's the you know best thing I ever did for me. You know, 
It's just it's crazy. I mean, come on, Doug, right? I mean, <laughs> when does that happen, right? <laughs> I know. It was nuts. So the rest is, is history. It was my pleasure to do that. And the Soviets were great. You know, they they would watch what I would eat every day and then and what I wouldn't eat. And then that night I'd get a knock on my door and there would be food, more food of what I had eaten. So in case, you know, they wanted me to stay healthy because all of a sudden I was a big star over there. They're getting rich off me. They don't want me to get sick, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was on billboards over there in Moscow. I was in any picture. Yeah, I've got some pictures someplace, man, me on a billboard in Moscow. <laughs> What a riot. You are killing me, oh, man. You are just killing me. I couldn't believe it, you know. And Nixon brought you See, I, Yeah. I, th I think there should be a billboard of Doug up in L.A., <laughs> yeah. right? You know, that's, that, that'd be a great I'll, thing. I'll tell you a funny story about that. Uh, I, I was rooming uh, on that tour with my buddy uh, Bruce Paulson, who used to be on The Tonight Show band playing trombone. Anyhow, before that, he and I were in college together. And so one night on this Soviet tour, we went into our uh, our room and there was a gold May bedspread on our bed. And I off the cuff said to Bruce, man, if this was the United States, I'd be taking that bedspread home with me. And he said, yeah. Ha, ha, ha. So we go to dinner, we come back and the bedspread's gone. They were bugging our rooms, and they heard me say that I was going to steal the bedspread, and they took it off. <laughs> oh, man. And then one night, uh, some of the interpreters had me uh, go through a whole list of dirty words, obscene words and stuff that they had seen in texts and in novels but didn't know the name of. So they sat me down, and for two hours, I told them what all those words meant. And that was just a riot, you know. <laughs> oh, man. Oh man, thank you so much for telling that story, yeah, Stan. That that just I got I got a ear to ear grin going on yeah. right now, man. Hey, but do you mind if we move no. on a little bit, man? Because because no. in 1971, your your life really changed, right, man? Yes, it did. Um, at 71, I went down to uh, Disney World and as the first leader of the Disney World band. And I went down actually before then, and Sonny Anderson had sent me down there, and we and Jim Christensen, we hired the local musicians to open the park. So we had auditions, uh, and then seventy one opening day, man, there it was. I was the I was the first leader of the Disney World band, and it was unbelievable. It was great for me, you know, just absolutely great for me. And then I stayed down there for two and a half years or so and could not stand Orlando, Florida in the heat and the humidity. <laughs> and, you know, and I went, you know what? You're not going to like me, but I'm going to have to to uh, to probably quit. And so they said, no, don't quit. We'll, we'll, how about if we take you out to Disneyland and have you be the leader of the Disneyland band? Because that band has kind of gotten a little sidetracked and they're not quite doing what we want them to do anymore. So would you go out there? And I said, yeah. So then that's how I became. So that was what, 74, uh, right, man? 73. Yeah, 73 or 4. 73? Yeah, 73 or 4. Well, we're going to put some pictures up of you right now uh, showing you, but one of my one of the ones that we were talking about off camera is uh, of your two boys when they were little, 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 and there's Stan in your, uh, in your uh, leader garb there, and your one son's got a clarinet and the other one's got a pair of drumsticks yeah. and they must have been what like two yeah they were real young really young two or three years old and what are they doing now that this is the crazy part now josh uh is sting's drummer and has been for 15 years and also he plays with uh offspring. the offspring so that's what he's doing and Jason is still with Green Day. He's been with Green Day playing keyboards since uh, the American Idiot Tour, which was 15 years ago. So Jason's been playing sax and tenor sax and keyboards uh, all these years later with Green Day. Isn't that funny? It figures, right, man? Because never falls far from the tree. Well, you know That's what? I'm just so, the way I, I tell people I'm lucky. I've got two kids who are rock and roll musicians, and I don't support either one of them. You know? <laughs> I'm the only guy that can say that. No, oh, man. No, but they're really good guys, too. You know, that's the cool thing about both of them is they're very cool about everything. You know, they don't let any of this stuff go to their head, which I'm happy for. Hey, Stan, um, do you mind talking a little bit about all of the roles that you had at Disneyland? I mean, because 
when Doug and I first started there, I mean, Doug was what, 82 80, for you? 83. 80. No, 82. And yeah. Uh-huh. 82. And then I was 85. And at that time, um, you were conducting, but you were doing other stuff too. So can you, can you kind of talk about all the different roles that you've had at, at Disneyland? Well, because yeah. Sonny loved you. Yeah. Loved and, <laughs> and when Sonny retired, right? Right. Yeah, so that was it. Really worked out great for me because uh, what I did is I led. Uh, they wanted me to. They, we were going to. We had a, a. We had hired a leader of the Disneyland band that we didn't like, and we wanted to get rid of it, and so we did. And so then we couldn't find another leader to replace him. You know, we shouldn't have done that, but we couldn't find the right guy. So finally, they said, "Guess what, Stan." You're the right guy. <laughs> You're going back in and be the leader of the band. And, and it was great for me. So I did that in the morning. So in the morning, I led the band in Town Square. The afternoon, then I booked the small band entertainment. I would book some of the, uh, the musicians, audition the musicians, worked with the small groups, worked with you guys. And so that, that worked out to be a, a terrific deal for me. 45 years in one place doing what you love to do, because I know you really did. I mean, Doug, I mean, I, I can't even imagine, right? I mean, well, I'm coming up close, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but 45 years with with the company and towards the end, I mean, was it really hard to sit there and say, I'm going to retire? Uh, yeah, I guess it was pretty tough you know it's a decision i had to make because uh i wasn't the money that i was making was just going right to taxes i mean i wasn't there was nothing that there was no reason to stay on because i was i wasn't making any money really you know after all said and done so i just thought you know my this might be a great time to do it so we did it and uh then i still worked out there as a consultant uh, on and off. Well, we're gonna we're gonna put up a video right now of uh, you playing with the mariachi divas on your retirement luncheon, and and I, and I think it's just really really nice. So everybody, check this you out know, right well, now. Before you, before you do that, let me tell you about the yeah. Movie. Go before you do here. There's a girl named Cindy Shea. She's uh, a Norwegian, blonde, blue hair, but she loves mariachi music, and so. She came to me years ago, years and years ago, and said uh, that she would like to uh, have a mariachi band out at Disneyland. And I said, I'll tell you what, if you can put a band together where the guys will show up on time, have all the silver studs up and down their pants, because that's, you know, the mariachi bands that I had, uh, I had trouble that way as far as, you know, making sure that they were on time and cool and blah, blah, blah. Anyhow. So she said, yeah, I'll do that. So she did. And uh, I said, I promise you, I will give you employment the rest of your life. Make sure the girls are on time. They're not drinking. They look great. And that, and you can just retire. Well, she's still out there, you know, all these years later, because that's exactly what she did. She got a bunch of great girls together. And, uh, and they are. They're all great girls. And they play great, you know. So Cindy's the one that really did that, boy. Got to put hands off to that Norwegian blonde mariachi girl. Well, hey, let's check out the video right now. I got to admit, I'm a huge fan of Hee Haw. Okay, I, I will admit to what I will admit to watching it. It was always on in my house when I was growing up, and uh, you know, the, the Lulu's moment of inspiration and Hey Grandpa, what's for supper? You know, gloom, despair, and agony on me. I mean, I got all this stuff memorized. So, can I ask you, Stan? What what were you? What did you do on the show? I mean, I I can understand why they would want you, but what? Well, I had to get on the show who first. Did you, and so the way yeah. I did that was I realized one day 
that I was 43 years old and, rec and had recorded every kind of music you could record on the tuba except country. And I went, oh, man, now what do I do? You know, <laughs> so I thought, OK, before I before my next birthday, I've got to record a country tune. So I started thinking about everything and what you know, and finally I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to write one. So I wrote one called You Ain't Lived Till You've Kissed a Tuba Player. And so uh, I got, oh yeah, play that country tuba. That was it. And I got my buddy John Jorgensen on guitar and, and a few other guys. And, and we went in, we made a demo of that, of that tuba song. And I brought it in to play for my boss the next day. And, and he said, oh man, I got to call Sam Labello, my friend who produces Hee Haw. And he said, uh, th th he'll, he'll love this thing. So sure enough, he called Sam Lavello up in Hollywood and said, Sam, I'm, I'm sending my friend Stan Freeze up uh, with a tune that he wrote, and I want you to hear it. So I drove up there, and I walk in the office, and I sit down, and we start to play You Ain't Lived Till You've Kissed a Tuba Player. And I get halfway through, and Sam Lavello stands up from his desk and walks away. And I go, what the heck is this, man? Listen to the rest of my song. And he starts marking on a, a, a chalkboard. And when the song's over, he just sat down and said, I want you in Nashville this day, this day, this day, this day, this day on hee -haw. And so that, that was all there was, man. He just, he didn't laugh. He didn't say it was funny, anything else. He just said, this day, this day, this day on hee -haw. And so <laughs> down there, and it was great. You know, I was totally great. But here's the wild thing. So I'm in there the first day, and we were taping Yeehaw. And none of, nobody knew me. I didn't know anybody. And what we would do is we'd go over uh, that, the morning of the show. We would go everybody's charts and blah, 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 blah. So I'm sitting there and these guys, all of a sudden, they see me come in with a tuba and, and they look like, oh, man, here we go. You know, these these he -ha musicians. So they're looking at me, this guy from California with a tuba. This is not what they wanted to see that day. So uh, we started to play and I played the th we played the tape and the guys freaked out in the band. And uh, so like there was uh, Charlie McCoy, there was Chet Atkins, there was, you know, all of these great players just thinking that it was the greatest thing they had heard. They were laughing and having a great time. And so that's kind of how it all happened, just by mistake, you know. And you deal with. <laughs> no, yeah. Here's the deal. My deal was with Hee Haw is that I could be on the show as many times as I could write a funny song about the tuba that Charlie uh, uh, Roy Clark and I could do because Roy Clark's a tuba player. So, uh, so we would tape the show every six months. Some six month periods, I was so busy at Disney, didn't have time to write anything. Some six month periods, I had time and I'd write two or three tunes and then. We would record them and send them out there, and uh, then I'd be on the show two or three times that segment. But it all depended on how many tunes I could write. Oh, here's the funny thing. I didn't tell anybody at Disney that I was doing these things. And I never got, because I didn't want to get in trouble, well, I never did because nobody at Disney would admit they watched Hee Haw. So I knew I was clean, you know, and it was. It was so funny. But anyhow, so that's the end of that. Stanley. Well, Minnie Pearl had herself a kissing booth each year at the Cornfield County Fair. It was a fearsome competition between the men that she was kissing as to which man was the hottest kisser there. As I watched the men line up, I put my tuba down and I puckered up to try her kisses out. When we finally finished kissing, both her dental plates were missing, and she caught her breath and she began to shout. You ain't little till you kiss a tuba player, no one kisses like a tuba player can. He can make you lose control, start a fire in your soul, no one kisses like a tuba playing man. <laughs> Band with our special guest Stan Freeze. Charlie, let her go. Two,
you know, after 45 years of working at, at Disney and doing all this other stuff and just, just really, you know, advancing our instrument to a place that, you know, nobody ever thought it could really go. Um, what's keeping you busy these days? Um, we're going to throw some pictures. There's some pictures of you playing at the House of Blues. Who are you playing with over there? You know what? I've done the House of Blues a few times. Uh, funny you should ask. Uh, most of the time I do it with a punk band called the Vandals. <laughs> so, you know, my my son Josh uh, is in the Vandals, and I've done a lot of punk things with them. Uh, I went down for the big funk, uh, punk festival in Hawaii and played tuba. You know, people throwing stuff because of those punk concerts, you know, they throw stuff at you. And uh, two six thousand people in the mosh pit, and they're throwing stuff. So anyhow, yeah, crazy stuff like that. It was really fun. Uh, and then uh, Tara and I are like contracting a bunch of stuff. Uh, I'm doing recording first of all. I record, you know, stuff with, with uh, when the boys want me to sit in or do something. Or, or Queens uh, of the Stone Age, you did something. Yeah, Queens of the Stone Age. I recorded on their album. Um, uh, and so just. Out at Knots, what we're doing is we have uh, these bands that we rotate through there, and they're all really fun guys, and Knots is a great place to work for, uh, and it's just real laid back and fun, and we're out there a lot doing that. And my, the deal is with me, I I take this as really my a gift that I'm able to give good employment to so many musicians. You know, I'm giving musicians employment, and I'm thrilled about that. I mean, I don't talk about this much. I'm talking about it now with you. But I don't mention it much because people think I'm corny. But that's really my blessing. And uh, and I've told that to let the boys know that's how I feel. A lot of people, but I am blessed to be able to give employment all over the country, you know, to really good players. And how many people get that gift? So, you know. Yeah, dude. I mean, Stan, that's that's like the best thing ever, man. I mean, I'm really glad you said that, Doug. Well, you're again, yeah, you're giving people a chance, and in the music business, you know, that's all you get is yeah. uh, if you can get an audition, you've got everything. Yeah. So you know, lucky me. So you got to tell me the story again about the snake sousaphone because i'm still super jealous yeah <laughs> and you told me it was a guy that was working on your corvette or something well, like that man who, is that the guy that painted cars for george barris painted custom cars and uh so i found him and i explained what i wanted you know i just said i would like to have this painted like a snake, you know, a boa constrictor, so it sucks my ear out. And he says, okay, cool. So he says, uh, I'll see you in a few days, right? Is that how it happened? Something like that. And he came back, you know, $1,000 later, $1,500 later. I went, holy Moses. But anyhow, so yeah, so it's painted like a snake and it's fun, you know, just to do that and have fun with it. No, man, it's it's more than fun. It's totally cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally cool. Oh, yeah, I got two of my feet. You've you, you seen the tuba tree, right? You know, I've got... Oh, yeah, I've seen the tuba tree, man. tubas hanging in my pepper tree out my front yard. And the, the, the yeah. wild thing is that somebody said, don't people steal that stuff out of there? I said, no, they actually add stuff. I'll come out there in the morning and there'll be some baritone hanging there or some, you know. And then here's a crazy thing. That tuba tree is listed on the International Girl Scout um, scavenger, hunt. scavenger Hunt for Girl Scouts all over the world. <laughs> this is one of the things that's on their scavenger hunt. So we'll, we'll look out there some morning and there'll be – and the thing is that that Girl Scout has to have an adult with her to take the picture to prove that it was actually done. And we'll go out there and there will be, you know, this these girls getting their picture taken under the tuba tree to send to the international whatever, Girl Scouts. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. It's this, oh, get this. It's listed under things to see in Orange County. I wish I could get it off of there, I'll tell you, you know, because <laughs> people driving by all the time, aren't they, Tara? They're all the time there. See, man, not only not only are you a treasure to Disneyland and the Disney Company, but you're a treasure to Orange County and and pretty much all of the United States, man. I can't say enough well, that's about all kind. Just that's too kind. How no, it's not kindness, man. It's the truth. And to have 
a friend and a colleague like you, man. Oh, man. I really, really well, thank you very much. That's the nicest thing you could have said, and I so do appreciate that. Yeah, I feel the same way about you. You know, it's just terrific. We've got this relationship, and we're blessed. Lucky and blessed. Well, I hate to say it, but I think we're I think we're going to wrap it up here, man. Doug, do you get anything to get, to get us out, man? I I just have one question. Has have you had first of all what you've done and what you do? Can it be taught? And have you had any students throughout your life who've who I know you don't have any extra time, but if you did, and if you could pass on just a little bit of what you've done, have I had students um, over the years? Yeah. So you've taught what you do to them. Oh, not really. Have I? No. I don't think so. Not really. Mm-hmm. You know, but most yeah. people, first of all, all I play is B-flat tuba. I don't play C, E-flat, or F. I call myself a B-flat tuba player. And that's, that's mm-hmm. what I do. I play bebop, you know, rock and roll, B-flat, polka fun tuba. So I really don't even consider myself a real tuba player, you know, that plays all the literature and, you know, and what have you, because that's not me. I do the thing for fun. And uh, no, I don't think anybody else has really even wanted to. I don't blame them. What about your job like you have at Disney, booking and that kind of stuff? Yeah. So anyhow, pretty much it. (laughs) Anything else? (laughs) What are you laughing at? Thank you, Stan. No, we can't thank you enough for being part of the show today, oh, Stan, man, and and thank you for the legacy, Doug. Anything else, man? Thank you. It's great. I'm glad. It's glad just to know absolutely you, Stan. great. Yeah. And uh, for our audience out there, we want to thank you for tuning in and sharing a little bit of uh, Stan Freeze's life with us. And we're going to be back hopefully next week with another episode of Conical Supremacy. Once again, Mr. Stan Freeze, we thank you very much for your time and. I'll see you next week, probably, bro. Anyway, so, Doug, hope you have a great day, man. And uh, everybody out there, peace out. Have a wonderful time. And we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. have made the rounds about traveling bands in honky-tonk towns, but for tuba players, this has got to be a first. Well, this one starts like they all do. I've been traveling hard for a day or two, and I stopped into this joint to quench my thirst. Well, I walked this big mountain man, said, what you got there, a garbage can? I said, excuse me, that's my tuba, if you please. Well, he said, great, play a country song so me and my buddies can sing along. And I told him I only play with symphonies. Wrong. Well, he slammed his fist and spit out his beer, and his body language made it very clear this wasn't going to be just another B-flat day. That's when he cocked his 30 out 6 and man, I let out with some country licks. I never thought I'd hear this tuba play.